cool. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so before we dig into that, um, talk more about that, um, I would like to do like a quick introduction in Arabic about you guys. Um, and then I'll, I'll pass it back to you and you can tell me more, a little bit more about yourself and we'll dig into like the whole production music and you know, how artists uh, can benefit uh, from it. Um, What's happening about the video, Abed? Is, are you going to play that or have people already seen that? Oh, no, no like it's been played a lot. Yeah, yeah, people like, saw it. Yeah, yeah, and like the feedback that we got for that video is absolutely insane. People absolutely <laughs> loved it. Oh, really? Like, mad editing skills. <laughs> That's, uh, yep. <laughs> That's been a learning curve because we, we started doing editing on videos. So yeah. yeah. Oh, All right. So um, um, okay. Marhaba uh, um, Uh, مرحبا نور مرحبا رفي uh, حسن uh, وكل اللي عم يشوفونا على الفيسبوك uh, الويبينار هاي الجمعة راح يكون عن البرودكشن ميوزك لايبراريز مارتن واندي uh, صاروا يشتغلوا مع بعض 26 سنة uh, بهاي الفترة كتبوا أكثر من 1500 uh, مقطوعة موسيقية uh, كتبوا موسيقى لأفلام كبيرة زي توي ستوري فايندينج نيمو ذا مابتس وكمان كثير أفلام برامج تلفزيون، دعايات، كثير كثير اشياء ثانيه. هذا الويبنر كثير كان مهم لإلي انه ينعمل لانه انا كمان يعني بهذا المجال وكفنان اللي بكتب موسيقى و برودوس ميوزك زي كثير من اللي بحضرونا بعرف انه في كثير فنانين اللي بيعرفوش عن هذا المجال وبيعرفوش قديش هذا المجال ممكن يكون يكون انه يجيب مدخول كثير منيح للفنانين وبفكر انه هاي يعني انه هذا من اهم الويبنرز اللي راح تنعمل بي ام اكس فشكرا انكم ضميتوا لنا اذا في عندكم اي سؤال اكتبوا هون او بالفيسبوك ونبلش بحول شيء ل مارتن واندي وهن بيحكوا عن الموضوع رح يكون الحكي بالانجليزي بس اذا في حدا عنده اي سؤال ما فهمش اي شيء يسالنا الميوزك لايبراريز هي عمليا موسيقى اللي انت بتكتبها وبتطلعها عن طريق عده شركات في ملايين شركات اللي عم بتدور على موسيقى كل يوم من الشكل وهن بحطوا هاي الموسيقى بافلام وبرامج تلفزيون وهيك بس لسه بنفوت على اكثر تفاصيل نبلش Okay, so um, I did like a quick introduction. Um, the good thing you can't know if I said good or bad things about you guys, so that's cool. <laughs> I noticed that Martin was nodding slightly then. Where I, <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what he was understanding in that. <laughs> I, I know the word, I knew shotgun. I, well, I remember. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's, let's start. Just tell us, like, people saw the video, so they probably know. All about you. Um, just like a quick introduction for the people who didn't have the chance to see the video. Um, actually, I tried to play it before, but the audio and the streaming didn't work. <laughs> so. That was his editing. That was how it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, let's start. So I'm Martin. Hi everybody. If you, uh, I, it's it, it's a bit odd here because all we can see is Abed. So there could be one person out there, and there could be a million. But I. I suspect it's probably closer to one, but uh, however many of you there, thanks for uh, tuning in, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to um, to talk to you. And so this is Andy, and we've been um, partners writing music for I think it's about thirty three years now, and just starting as hobbyists, and then working up. Um, sort of just climbing a slippery slope really and grabbing everything we could never saying no to anything and after about five or six years it turned into a, a sort of a small income and a, a living and probably after about 10 years it turned into a full-time living and which is great because when it's a full-time living you create more time for yourself to create more music to create more money to create more income to create more time it's a it's a good circle rather than a vicious circle and uh, so for the last probably 25 years, we've been full-time musicians. I think we're probably slightly unique in that we work exclusively together in our professional music, um, in, our, in our composition, 
we always work together and we only work together that's that's not that's anything we've really ever discussed it's just something that's happened and uh yeah we've managed to kind of trick people into using us for 25 30 years and we're still here it feels like we're kind of clinging on by our fingernails sometimes because it's an uncertain world but yeah. we're still here and i think we're kind of we've surprised ourselves that we've managed to do this for so long and make an income out of what effectively is a, is a very nice hobby and we are kind of just living proof that it can be done uh, and uh, you know it's, it's it's a pleasure to be able to kind of share any of our experiences i don't know how useful it will be but um, we're very happy to answer any questions that yeah. you have amazing thank you guys for being here um it's honestly an honor to talk to you <laughs> um all right, so the, the first thing, um, so people in Palestine and in general musicians in the Middle East don't know anything about production music or as was called library music. Um, so I would like if, if you can tell us, it's, it's a big subject, but if you can tell us like a, in a couple of words about like what it is and yeah, so production music is, uh, traditionally it was instrumental music that was, it's written and produced specifically for use on TV, film, I mean all media now obviously, but traditionally it was, you know, originally TV and film. Um, it's pre-licensed, so it's ready to go for any users, so a TV producer can say I need a piece of music to go with my footage, or have a look at this music library, uh, here's a tune I like and he can just use it. He doesn't have to contact the publisher. He just fills in a cue sheet, which says, this is the piece of music I've used. I've used this duration and this is where it'll be broadcast. Uh, and then royalties come back and that's kind of how it's always worked. I have to say it's getting much more complicated with all the online stuff, but basically it's the same principle. Uh, I think one of the sort of main changes that has happened over the years is that there are many more tunes now that are songs with lyrics and vocals and things on as well as just instrumental music. Um, all genres are covered and it's a massive industry that, you know, there are thousands and thousands, if not millions of tracks out there. So competition is high, but you know, it is a good income if you kind of work hard at it. So. it. It is just worth pointing out in case there are any TV producers watching that you do have to be registered with the publisher to yeah, use sorry, the tracks. Sorry. So <laughs> it's not that you don't have to have any permission, you do register, but once you're registered with a publisher like Universal, then yes, it's carte blanche as long as you actually register the tracks that you've used. Um, I think it's worth pointing out because it's not, maybe not so much now, but perhaps up to about 10 years ago, I think there was a, an un, a perhaps a, an idea that library music, and if anyone's confused, library music and production music are exactly the same thing. It's just, it used to be called library music. I think maybe there was a connotation that it was played in libraries. So people started <laughs> using the word production music and it was the same thing. But there was a general feeling, especially you know, for us when we mentioned we did production music or library music. And there's a slight sort of looking down your nose, thinking, oh, it's just lift music, it's background music, it's musical wallpaper. And if you listen to any of the libraries, it's anything but the, the production values are right up there with, you know, the top artists. Um, and that's partly to, due to the fact that good equipment is very affordable now, but it is certainly not a poor relation. And also in terms of income, there are library writers that are making serious money out of it. And it, I keep saying this as an example, but you know, there are some famous film composers, I won't name them because they might not like it publicised, but there are some famous film composers, people who are doing Hollywood blockbusters, that you, household names in the film business, and they are passing tracks onto libraries that uh, maybe they're not used in films or they're filling downtime. So it's yep. definitely not a poor relation. I know that some of the American libraries actually sign up chart bands to write for them. So it's high quality stuff. Um, maybe we're the exception, I don't know. But um, <laughs> it, so, and the other thing, it, if anyone's still unclear, it's like the musical version of Shutterstock. So it's, an, it's like a photo stock library, but with music. And the reason library music actually came about was because an awful lot of television doesn't have the budget to have commissioned music in it. 
So rather than paying maybe thousands of pounds to score a program, mm -hmm. it's a cheaper alternative. You can license music and you can license it depending on where it's being broadcast. So you can get a worldwide license or just one territory license. So it's quite flexible and it's very quick for people making TV programs. And evidently by the amount of library companies there and the, you know, they're obviously doing well, it, it, it's a, it's a, it can be a lucrative business to be in. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know um, Chuck D has an album or two, and yeah. uh, I think it was I don't I don't remember which library. I know that also uh, Search Tankayan from System of a Down has a production music uh, yeah. album also, uh, and there's a lot, a, absolutely a lot of like you know a list artists who does that yeah. too. Robbie yeah. Robertson yeah. songwrites rights for the Universal and. Um, but there's a sort of general lesson there, isn't there, really, that really to make a living in music, and I think particularly nowadays, you have to be looking at opportunities all over the place. You can't rely on, you know, a, someone who's kind of in chart in the charts now, more than likely in 10 years, isn't going to be. So, you know, they've got to be thinking ahead. If you want a career that's got longevity to it, you know, that's going to last your working career, you need to be looking around for different ways of of you know making money from your music yeah. and production music is a great thing that can run in the background at really at whatever level you want it to to a certain extent obviously it's dependent on on the publishers but we uh, you know for example we were writing production music that was the main thing we did to start with which was great it got us going it led on as i said in the video for anyone who's seen it it led on to um uh, TV producers getting in touch with us. They'd heard our library track, so we like that. Can you write us something? So that then started us off on on uh, work that was actually commissioned rather than uh, library work. That we got pretty busy with that, and and throughout our career, that's been probably you know for the most of the time what's kept us pretty busy. But the library music, the production music, is always there underneath. It fills any gaps. You know, if we haven't got commissioned work, we can start writing some library tracks ready for you know uh, for release and it also has a there's a kind of base income that you you're earning from the production music as well you know yep. if you haven't written a lot of it it's not massive but it's there all the time so i mean the the whole covid thing has been a you know a really good example of where that is is a such a bonus you know you've got this steady stream that's coming in regardless of you know, if you were a, a jobbing musician, you gigs that were cancelled, that were, you know, it must have been devastating for a huge, you know, uh, area in the music business. But, you know, the library music just has this steady. Yeah, I think so. I think the other thing, again, it may be clear, but just to reinforce it is that library music is a sort of slow and steady thing. So, you know, if you've got a track and it earns £100 a year, you might be very disappointed after the first year. But if it does that for 20 years and it only took you two days to do, well, that's a very profitable two days. Now, it may go the other way. It may run for 20 years and only make you £50. And then it's obviously not been a good use of your time. But we feel with the volume of music that we've written over the time, it's a bit like buying raffle tickets. You know, you, the more you have, the more you have the chance of winning. And it sort of evens up and gets some unusually lucrative tracks and then some rather disappointing ones it all yeah. sort of tends to blur out in the wash but it's you have to be very clear it's not a get rich scheme by any means no. but it's a kind of slow and steady almost like a pension thing that just yeah. sort of dribbles away um yeah. i mean there are, having said that there are writers who have made uh, you know really good money from it you know uh, yeah so it can be a get rich and, scheme. And there are people, just with you saying again about our balance, there are definitely writers that do mainly commissioned work and then just a little bit of library. There are people that do 50 50, and then there are people who don't do any commissioned work at all. And it's just all library. So you can make a living out of it. Um, yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's the perfect way where you can. That I would like, I think the downside of it that you don't see the money immediately, it usually takes some time yeah, to start deal. seeing the income. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it does take a while. I mean, if you think of that, uh, so if you write a piece of music, and this is very rough, but if you write a piece of music 
then you would realistically only expect it to go out six months afterwards because it's got to fit into your publisher's release schedule. It's probably going to be another six months before a, a significant body of people have actually stumbled across the track. Mm-hmm. It might be six months before they feel, well, I'd, I'll use that track in something. Six months before it's reported to the PRS or your whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know, your collection society. Another six months before they... Uh, I think I'm up to about three years at the moment, <laughs> but you know, it can be that long. Uh, so it is a long cycle, but, and we definitely have had experience of other writers who um, we've kind of collaborated with or not so much collaborated, but they we've kind of recommended them and they've had music out. And after 12 months, because they haven't seen any, any significant money, they've stopped and they go, Oh, that's a waste of time. And of course, then two or three years later, they suddenly get a check for three or four hundred pounds and they go, oh, actually. But then they've stopped and they've lost the momentum. So, yeah. And, then, yeah. It, and I think I'm very grateful to Andy because when we started out, Andy had a bit more knowledge about this than me and was very, I was quite fed up going, oh, this just isn't <laughs> paying. And he said, no, slow and steady, you know, just be patient. You've got to wait for these things. And rather than, we always use the analogy that rather than borrow money from a bank, like most businesses, we borrowed time from ourselves. So we didn't invest money in the business, we invested our time. I love that. Um, and, and it worked out eventually. Yeah, I, and it can be quite unnerving because, you know, two years down the line, if you're not seeing significant money coming in, it, it does feel, have I wasted that time? But in our experience and and you know chatting to loads and loads of other library production music writers everyone has the same experience and i think there's a kind of general three-year rule that people yeah. kind of you know if they've stuck with it for three years at the three-year point you know it, it is beginning to earn you decent money at that stage so or not or not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you have totally wasted yeah, three years uh, should have been a I mean, the point is you know you can be doing it while you're doing all the other things that you would normally do with your music you know it's, it's not like it's going to take up your entire you know working week mm. you can you can fit it in and, you know i mean we we were both working in full-time jobs <laughs> when we started writing production music and we just worked in the evenings writing the, the music we got together in evenings and we just you know invested that time i mean if, you, if you're lucky enough to be fully occupied doing commissioned work then you won't need to be doing library and and well done but yeah. very few musicians are fully occupied with writing so when you're not or rather when you're not occupied with commissions do some library rather than sit around doing nothing that's what we figured what? The, usually the process with musicians is like when you write a track or when you produce music um not everything you produce you release it like uh, your you would be yeah. a, your own you know your best commercial release you can also like all those tracks that you're not sure about them if yeah. like how do you feel about them you can take those tracks finish it, those tracks, put yeah. it in an album and sell that album. And, like it's... And by no means is that a kind of a suggestion that it's inferior or kind of, oh, no. you know, oh, it's just my, my kind of throwaway stuff that wasn't good enough elsewhere. Not at all. We all know that you, I mean, we haven't done a lot of commission work. We've written countless tracks that we knew were very good, but the producer yeah. didn't. Well, or that they weren't right. I mean, they yeah. might have said they were rubbish or they might have said they were just not right for the job. And a lot of the time they're just not right, but we know they're good enough. So they've gone out as library. Everything yeah. gets recycled. We, we invented recycling, but it was with music rather than plastic. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, yeah, again, it's like, it's, I think this is the artist's best option for like um, passive income. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good way of looking at it. Um, okay, we have a bunch of questions already. Um, let's dive in. Uh, how does a, how does artists with no experience in this start rights for music libraries? So, well, I think the first thing I'd do is I would uh, log on to, say, the Universal Production Music website and take a look at the sort of music that's on there and kind of figure out the way that it's laid out in terms of a piece of music so you know is it like a song or does it progress without a kind of first chorus whatever layout 
just kind of check out how it how it works and once you've kind of think you've got a handle on that then obviously have a go at writing something and and that it's good to play it against stuff that's on tv as well yeah you know if you um if something that you enjoyed watching on telly you like the music for try rewriting uh, a piece of production music that would sit under that and you find that there are certain kind of cut points and lulls and and things in the music that you write that will work with it other things won't work and you can kind of hone your skills like that um and then obviously if you're at that stage happy with what you're doing then start approaching um library music companies and you know just are they taking people on you know what uh, send them tracks yeah universal has a submissions kind of um most publishers now, yeah right? most of them do sorry no, i'm only some, saying yeah, universal, the universal. Because that's where yeah. most of our um, experience is. it should just say you don't actually have to log on or register with any of the libraries that you can just listen to the yeah. tracks you can't download yeah. them you can audition everything but you can audition everything and just listen one thing i think is worth pointing out is that again library when it started was well my understanding was it was much more kind of just background it yeah. was less designed to be featured but nowadays as we said earlier you get stuff with vocals on so there is the whole range you will get stuff that's very ambient with not an awful lot going on which is incredibly useful but at the other end you might have something that's incredibly thematic mm -hmm. or catchy with very very prominent lines so you really have to listen to quite a few different albums and see the range but i think andy's absolutely right you know get a piece of footage and and write to that and see what works and see what doesn't um yeah and do you feel there's a difference when you write for libraries and write for film and tv or write for commercial music like what's I think it's probably in a way it's quite similar because you've got the range. I mean, if we're doing, we, I should say, we do an awful lot of kids music, uh, not something we ever chose to do. We've sort of ended up being dragged down that route and it's been, been great fun, but that means a lot of the stuff we do is very thematic mm. because the very nature of a theme tune is it's a call to arms. You need to get people in. It, it's an alert. So it has to be very thematic and very catchy. But then within programmes, you're writing stuff that's not so thematic, that's, you know, not not fighting with dialogue or fighting with sound effects. So I think it, in a way it's quite... It's quite, it's pretty similar, yeah. really. You, yeah. I mean, you have to, you know, you look at all different genres and, and well, different intensities as well. Just to, and if, and like I said earlier, you know, production music is, is a substitute in a lot of cases for people not having the budget to commission music. So it's trying to recreate that commission music. So some of it will be thematic and some of it will be more underscore based. And I should say, if anyone's unaware of this, that if you look on a, any library publisher's website and listen to tracks, you'll get a full version and then there'll be an underscore version. And nowadays, almost all tracks would have stems. So, you know, a variety of different instruments, stems, so people can layer up their own uh, instrument combinations um yeah. so yeah it's a, it's a pretty flexible business nowadays um i have another question on facebook that says is this the type of business where you just put your work in libraries and wish for the best or there's tools and method for marketing um uh, it's really up to the libraries it's the public <laughs> deals with the i mean to a certain extent it is uh, the luck of the draw because you know you are part of a massive library and in most yeah. cases i think most of the libraries now are big libraries that the, the smaller ones have kind of been swallowed up by bigger ones so yeah so there is an element of luck uh, the publisher deals with the marketing and they you know they have pretty significant marketing teams worldwide um i'm always surprised when we get a piece of music published with the library when you look at your royalty sheets and you know there might not be massive incomes but there are a lot of uses worldwide and so yeah. you know if, you, if you're in with a library that's big enough which most of them are to be honest yeah. with you then your work will get picked up so it is the luck of the draw but uh you know you the odds seem quite good i mean well. i certainly historically as composers 
we would have never done any marketing with our library music. We would have left that to the publisher. Having said that, for the vast majority of our career, there hasn't been social media. But now yeah. there is social media. I, I don't know. I'm yeah. guessing some composers will do some of their own marketing. Some will just leave it to the uh, to the publishers. I sort of very good point actually because I follow quite a few composers on Instagram and and they definitely do push their own work yeah. and some of them yeah. have significant followings as well. I mean, I it I like everything nowadays. You kind of have to fight for every little bit you can, and the more you do, the more you get yourself out there, the better it is, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There is definitely a bit of put it out there and hope for the best because you know you can't once it's out there, it's a bit out of your hands, and you do have to hope tracks get picked up. And it, I should say that you know we've had tracks that for no apparent reason have been quite successful, and other tracks that you think, oh, that's a that's great, that's really going to hit the mark, and they seem to just not really do much. And it's quite hard to work out why some tracks just catch people's imagination it's, a, it's impossible to predict and, and we've in the past where we've had a successful track we've then tried to kind of mimic it afterwards total failure <laughs> it never works you know uh, you can't predict the success and you also can't kind of mimic it and and it's the same if you're listening to you know if you're trying to write you know stuff that's uh, very current and you're listening to the charts or whatever uh, to to imitate that music and kind of imitate its success is really difficult. It's impossible. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I find it quite a good way of kind of getting you started on a track, but at the end of the day, you need to steer your own course. Uh, or, you know, don't, don't or let the track take its own the, course. Well, the track quite but that's, a, I mean, that's not just production music writers, that's the yeah, pop industry as a whole. Yeah. I think it's called yeah. the second album, isn't it? <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> um, I had a question, <laughs> I had a bunch. Okay, so um, do you think for musicians should target like big libraries like Universal and like other the big ones uh, or go for boutique libraries first? It's really, like, simple. Um, it's a really simple answer. It's a choice of whether you're a big fish in a little sea or a little fish in a big sea. There are, there are pros and cons to both. You know, we're with Universal. It's the biggest music rights owner in the world, I, I believe. I yeah. think they currently stand at half a million tracks. It's sometimes easy to feel a bit lost in that, but the plus side is they have a they have a big marketing machine worldwide. They have very, you know, they're a big reach worldwide. If you're with a boutique library, you obviously get a, a better place on the bill and more attention. But if your boutique library is not getting through to customers then there's not much point in being high up. I have to say it's a question I think we ask ourselves daily and we don't really have the answer. I think it's, mm -hmm. and also I think it's fair to say that you maybe don't have a choice. You know, this, you know, it's not like you're in a position to go, well, I'm only going to go with this sort of library or that sort of library. Certainly when you start out, it might be just a case of taking, you know, whoever will take you. It, it's probably useful to point out that uh, I think as far as I know, in every single case, uh, production music writers aren't tied to a specific publisher. When you sign uh, over a piece of music, you literally sign over the rights of the music. You don't agree to write solely for that publisher. So, you know, if you get a, a deal for an album with uh, Universal one week, and then another week you're offered a deal with a boutique label, well, go for yeah. it. You, you're able well, to do that. So it's difficult to... Whilst that's totally legally correct, you obviously might sort of... Some libraries might feel a little bit protective of you or snubbed. I mean, I, I, I think... I think that used to be the case yeah, much more when, when the libraries were smaller. Well, I, think, I think nowadays... But I think it, what it may be is a, a one-way street. So... I, and again, I don't want to quote anyone, but I'm guessing some of the bigger libraries are less bothered about that. But you might find that smaller boutique libraries uh, are maybe a little bit funny about. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't know. We, we don't have experience of it, but people can make their own minds. Well, we did. We, early on, we did have experience of it. Well, because we did. We, <laughs> we, um, we were writing for 
a library and we were approached by another library <laughs> and um, it didn't go down we well. thought do do we ask our first library and see what they said and we decided we would do we'd play the kind of fair game and and we were definitely slapped on the wrists and told not to do it but i have to say you know this, we're talking hmm. Uh, you know, 20 years ago. But what I'm saying yeah. is we don't have experience of it now. No, so no I, I don't know. Point. Well, other yeah. than, I, the only thing I would say is that I know a lot of writers who do write for yeah. a lot of different libraries. And I uh, certainly recently, I've never heard anyone say, oh, I, you know, I got in trouble for doing this for this library when I was already doing stuff. For... So yeah. I, I think it's generally accepted that the music business is a difficult business to get into. And, and you know, if you're writing good music for one library, that that's great. They're happy with that. And you know, if you then write some tracks for another library, I, they're not gonna. I suspect it also comes down to the sort of thing you're doing. So if you did a very specific genre for one library, and then an album of exactly the same yeah, genre I think that's a for a, point, yeah. uh, you know, if you were writing one genre for Universal and say one genre for BMG or someone, I, I can imagine that wouldn't be particularly uh, something they'd be happy about. But I, you know if you're doing kids music for one library and opera for another then they wouldn't one. care yeah. um we had a question about sampling like uh, musicians who use samples in their music uh, when they submit albums for libraries it's clearly not <laughs> yeah it's you can't use samples that haven't been cleared that just isn't a thing I mean, sampling is an interesting point, actually, with regard to library, and this is just an anecdote rather than um, a lot of the library music from way back in the 70s was actually sampled during the 90s and used some of the beats and things were used in, in uh, chart tracks during the sort of 90s and early 20, uh, 2000s. So, I mean, I mean really also, we just need to clarify what we're talking about with samples. So if we're talking about sample libraries, Again, don't quote me, you need to check it yourself, but most commercial sample libraries are fine to use in library music. They get sometimes a bit funny about sort of having instruments too exposed, mm -hmm. but generally I think it's pretty much understood that this library is such a big business now that sample libraries need to have uh, their users' ability to to put the music yeah. in the library. But then if you're talking about sampling of other people's tracks, you know, sampling drum beats and stuff, well, that, absolutely not. It's a complete no-no. All right. Uh, I have so many questions. <laughs> um, and like when, when an artist reach a library, is it preferred to, for like the artist to send the, like one album that is done with a cover and like 10 finished tracks or just send one track? No, and I don't think so. I, I mean, you'd really have to check every individual library's submission requirements, but they will say something like send two tracks in maximum or three tracks maximum. They're, you know, libraries are big businesses and they're, they're quite well organized and they have a production schedule. So unless it's something very, very unique, I would have thought they're quite unlikely to just say, oh, great, that's an album. We'll just put that into our schedule. I think most libraries will have yeah, a schedule they're, 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 18 months ahead. Um, I'd have thought two or three tracks, and I'm guessing here, like Mark says, where I haven't kind of looked at uh, recently at what the submission kind of requirements are. But with regard to artwork and stuff, they, they deal with all that, so you don't have to worry about mm -hmm. any of that. It's literally just it would be. But again, you know, it, on smaller libraries, there may be different criteria, but any library will have its submissions criteria on its website. All right. Um, another question is, when they use it for films, do you alter the music afterwards to fit the scenes better? Do you need to learn film score? I think that's, uh, I get where that's coming from. Uh, they may well be used just as they are. It's quite possible that the, film people would approach you and say can you do us um, a different mix of this or a different length or whatever more often than not a piece of music is just used as it is but there have been occasions where we've been asked to alter tracks to um to suit the requirements of the you know whatever the you know whether if it's an advert or you know like you said film or whatever and now with people tending to provide stems um Film editors, editors yeah. film editors have a bit more flexibility to uh, to modify the track themselves. 
Yeah. Um, it's also like, um, again, we, 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 you mentioned that before, but when, when you write a track for the library, it's usually you have a bunch of versions of the same track. So yeah. one with like with yeah, percussion, well, I, one with other percussion. Yeah. So the, the, like the editors can use what they, they, could take, they could take the melodies off or the drums off and, and stuff like that. Um, and while we're on that topic, I, can you talk about a little bit about flexi tracks and <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we're as well as being composers, we we actually have our own library music label as well, which is part of Universal. So it's a that's quite common nowadays is that big library music publishers will have what they call third party labels. So in our case, and I think it's probably quite typical, we actually do do our own artwork and we, we're pretty much self-contained. We produce the music and we commission other people to write music for us as well. And then it goes out on the Universal website. And what we've done, in, and it leads on from the last question, is what we've done is we've actually added a further level of flexibility within the tracks so that as well as having stems we provide music in sections as well as far as we know we're the only people doing that and it's quite early days so it's only time will tell whether that's something that editors really um, take, to. take to we're hopeful it will and, and i mean it's sort of slightly back backtracking on a lot of things we've said previously because as composers we didn't do marketing but as label owners we do do marketing and universal do that as well but that you know that is because it's a label with a brand um that, that we're marketing and it's also because it's a it's a quite unique way of presenting music there is there's an idea there to market rather than just saying oh yeah. we've written some music it's great have a listen to it we're actually presenting a new method of supplying music yeah um, but it's early days uh, it's fun it's a lot a lot of work i think it's made us feel a little bit more charitable to the uh, producers and publishers that we've worked with in the past and we now realize what a difficult bunch of so-and-so's composers are to work with <laughs> and, uh, and um not all of them not all of them Have it. Not, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so it's made us feel a little bit more sympathetic because that running a label is a bit more to it than i think we thought at the beginning but it's yeah. great that we end up with We've become very good jugglers. We're juggling artwork and videos and tracks and, and, try, and trying to compose as well. Uh, but yeah, it's good fun. It's really good. Yeah, fun. that's like that. I wanted to ask you if you ever have like, you still have time to compose like with all that because it seems like a lot I haven't of work. Written, I haven't written a piece of music uh, since the beginning of lockdown, but I've... Well, yeah, well, you've been doing a fairly major... But I've been technical thing that we've been developing. We have lots of different oh. hats. So I'm kind yeah. of I'm international marketing director, and Andy social media director, and uh, so yeah, well, we've I've been doing a lot of the sort of production side as well. Yeah, but um, it's, I keep saying to him that he needs to let go of some of these things, and we need to <laughs> find someone else to do so that we can get back. <laughs> yeah. Because I think that's the worry is that I mean it, it sounds pathetic to moan about it, but we have to be careful because. Com composing is what we love doing you know that's what yeah yeah but i love doing the other stuff as well and i think that's but i think that's the joy of, of having a label is that you know i've always liked doing a bit of art and i know you have um so it's a it's a chance to say oh i'm going to do a bit of art and and andy loves the video making video editing and, yeah that's a whole new and <laughs> it's great fun and a bit of travel and go out there is a risk being a composer that you i mean i we kind of joked that we've been socially isolating for 30 years. So the, the lockdowns won't be any different for us. Haven't we? <laughs> Anything's changed because, you know, we've literally sat in front of this bank of monitors for 30 years. Uh, so it's, I love getting out and seeing people and uh, yeah, meeting people that are you, you, using your music. It's great fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, how do you guys stay like when you have to write this, like a huge amount of music how do you stay creative how do you like 
come with all these ideas for like new music do you like watch films yeah it's the, it's the question we never ask us yeah that's a dangerous <laughs> thing guys, isn't it you think of drugs it. no i well for me it's always it's listening to a lot of music i kind of i have playlists on spotify it would previously it would have been cassettes or whatever uh, and just things that you kind of things that inspire you. you think oh i'd love to try making something like that i think it's kind of having a really open mind in terms of the music that you'll listen to yeah, I agree. um and you'll find uh, well i do i i enjoy working on nearly every genre of music yeah. i can't think of anything where i've i've not enjoyed working on it so you know if you can keep an open mind and just enjoy what you're doing so so I'll, you know i'll have these tracks for inspiration and i'll kind of just cherry pick one out and i'll play it and listen to it and i've you know you may start almost copying some element of it but without doubt the music will kind of steer its own course and you get your own ideas and and that's that's how i work i know, think kind of... uh, i'm going to say something that's very sort of i don't know what the the opposite of ageist is but whatever it is i'm going to say it i think as a general rule when you're young you're a little bit more narrow-minded about what music you're into <laughs> i think you know all my, when i was young and i think my kids who are teenagers i mean they're fairly broad-minded with the music but probably partly because there's a lot of different music playing in our house but i think a lot of their friends would say oh no i'm into i'm into hip-hop and that's it or i'm yeah you know into r&b and that's kind of all i listen to and i i think we it's a great advantage if not a necessity if you're starting out and you're quite young to be really broad in what you listen to try and go outside your your natural preferences and really try and soak up lots of different music genres because one thing is for certain unless you are in the pop charts you are going to have to do lots of different music to make a living from it i think it's you'd be very very fortunate if you said well i'm going to just do you know tv themes or library and i'm only going to do grime or i'm only going to do r and i think it would be unheard of we can be doing a string quartet i mean we've been doing a string quartet last week and we can be working on you know also uh, he was going to say hip-hop then but obviously we're way too we're hard, to, we're, we try <laughs> but we, you know a whole we could be doing we could be doing kids music about dancing with your pants on your head in the morning and string quartet in the afternoon, a speed metal thing in the next day, <laughs> nice. and a, you know, a, a nursery rhyme. You've got to be broad. And I think that that's part of the inspiration is that by listening to just lots of, I'm, I'm like Andy, I just listen to Spotify. Like, oh, I'd like to do a piece of music like that. I really like that. Let's yeah. crowbar an album out like that. Um, it, it, I mean, that's, that's the joy exactly, of having yeah. your own label. It's like yeah. having your own sweet shop. You can say, oh, you know, I'd, I'd love to do a French gypsy jazz album. Um, well, let's do it. Let's, yeah. let's, let's put it in the schedule. Um, and that's, that's like the best way to, to like better your skills. Like it's like being a guitar player or a piano player. You don't just play heavy metal all your life. Like you have to learn blues. You have to burn, learn some classical music, jazz, maybe. Oh. Yeah, you haven't heard my heavy metal <laughs> skills on the piano, though, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> You'd never want me to play anything else. If you... <laughs> the point is, oh, all the yeah. genres of music involve skill, you know, and if you can stand back and, and look at those skills that are being used and admire them for what they are, you can then see the challenges involved in trying to write music in that style. And then, you know, rather than saying, oh, I hate, country and western music it's rubbish mm. you listen to it you think well actually that's you know they're doing some really clever stuff there let's have a go at that and you then you learn respect for all the different styles of music and then it yeah. becomes a real joy to to write in different styles one of the things that we did many years ago i'm gonna say 20 maybe 25 years ago is we got involved with a company where we were doing karaoke backing tracks that was a high point <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what, it was fantastic because it, it was a stream of income that enabled us to give up our day jobs. It was like an extra guarantee of, I don't know, maybe £200 a week or something where it wasn't guaranteed, but it yeah. 
it was definitely quite a steady thing. And, you know, we laugh about it now, but it, it was such a brilliant learning curve because you were taking the latest pop tracks and we were deconstructing them. And we had a, I think we had a day to do each one. Wow. And, you know, and then these pop tracks probably took a, three weeks to record. <laughs> and we were having to deconstruct them and find out how they did it. And it was a, such a brilliant um, yeah, you did. It was learning, a great, learning. Learning. great experience. Yeah. That's so again, if, if people have got time on their hands and they want to want to develop their production skills, um, you know, it's a great way. Listen deep and deconstruct and see. Uh, I remember there were two library writers who wrote for Universal some years ago, who we were quite friendly with, and they were really into Pink Floyd, and they couldn't work out how Pink Floyd had got some of their sounds. And they did a brilliant, really clever thing. They switched off their left and right speakers one by one so they could hear what was coming out of separate speakers. And then they realized that there were sounds that were made up of two different sounds. But once, oh, wow. when you were listening on the two speakers, you couldn't tell but how they were getting that effect. But once you isolated the speakers, you saw what, what the, the combination was. And it's little things like that. I love that sort of thing. And I mean, the the huge advantage is there's so much stuff on YouTube now that you can kind of, you can yeah. get people, you, they show you how they do things. So, yeah. you know. I mean, can I just say as well, I think it's quite important. We don't stand up here as kind of top end producers. We're, and I don't think even top end composers. Well, he can but, speak for himself. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're not, we're not at the cutting edge of pop production or anything like that. You know, we, yeah. we, we create everything ourselves so we learn a bit about production and i mean andy's background's more in recording engineering and mine's mm -hmm. more in sort of formal music training and stuff and that all comes together but you know we're by no means standing up here as the the zenith of production or engineering we just do you know good good composition good engineering good production and throw it all together and, it, and i and i think you're not, not got to get too obsessed about you know, being the, the loudest track or the cleanest track or the biggest. It's about the combination of good writing, sensible engineering and, and good production. And it's, you know. And, it, and it, I mean, it's a good point because it's totally possible to do it at home as well. It doesn't have to be done in a big studio. The, I mean, there are a lot of library tracks that are recorded in top end studios when they, are, I mean, yeah. there are a lot done with full orchestras and the kind of full on production. Yeah. But equally, there are very successful writers working in a small bedroom style studio, you know, if you want to yeah. be better. Just on the MacBook. Yeah. Um, with some I mean, the technology has, has made it, you know, it's democratized the whole thing. Yeah, like even today, it's not just with the library music, but also on top charts music, like the Billie Eilish album. I was just going to say yeah. Billie Eilish is a great example. It's yeah. Bedroom, you know. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about like genre specifically. Uh, do you have like any uh, recommendations for the people who are listening from the Middle East and Palestine about like writing in a specific genre? Maybe like uh, writing hip Middle Eastern hip hop or just focusing on hip hop, you know? Well, I think the thing to do is check out the libraries and see if they've got loads of a certain genre then obviously it, there's going to be more competition and less likelihood of it of whatever you submit being noticed or kind of accepted as it were but if you know there is no middle eastern hip-hop in the libraries then go for it you know the, uh, there's a market for everything what you ideally if you find a niche that you can kind of grab the attention of the the producers at the library then and and kind of once your foot's through the door once you've got a track or two that they've released they know who you are they know you can do it and you can then approach them for other work but yeah i would definitely look for areas that you think that you can do that are perhaps underrepresented on the on yeah. the libraries i mean that's probably quite a tall order i would definitely go in with with what you're strongest at at the moment you know so if for example you've concentrated on a specific genre of music it would be probably foolish to try and do something completely different if you you know if it's not your strength yeah. um, but you know I've, it, you just to have a look at what's out there and, and, and of course there's absolutely nothing to stop you 
approaching uh, production music companies all over the world. And yeah. certainly with Middle Eastern music, you know, the Middle East isn't the only market for Middle Eastern music. It's a, sure. it's a huge genre throughout the world because yeah. so many programs in the United States and in Europe being made on topics concerning the Middle East and you know, so there's yeah and there's in every respect markets. as well it'd be right, that, you know from holidays through to news you know it's yeah. that kind of whole spectrum of uses so. so just because production music may not be an established business in the Middle East it doesn't mean there's not a market for it yeah and that goes the same for you know Southeast Asian music and Chinese and, and stuff. Uh, we live in a very globalized media business now, so yeah. But I think I agree with Andy. Just focusing on your strengths and, like any other business, look at what's out there and see if you can find some gaps. And it may be that one publisher is well furnished with your genre and it may be that yeah. another publisher is not. And sell yourself to them. Say, you know, I, I don't think you've got this genre particularly well represented on your label. Here it is. And certainly from our experiences, very new label owners, you know, that's exactly the sort of thing you are looking for. Um, I, I should say another really important thing is for publishers is reliability and kind of so you know stress to them that you you're gonna you know if you write for them you will meet schedules and make sure you do meet schedules it's really really important I mean we this has been as Mark said it's been a really interesting uh, learning curve for us because we've had to deal with lots of new musicians some of them we knew already some of them are new to us um, and you very quickly find that some of them are absolutely red hot and inefficiency and others aren't and the ones who aren't become a, a nuisance to work with in some ways because you're constantly chasing them so there's a disproportionate amount of time spent with with some composers and that you know then you're not going to get employed by people if that's how you operate so you yeah. you know you've got to be um, business like about yeah. it. I mean, the fact is, there are vastly more composers than publishers. So, publishers yeah. are in the driving seat. And I mean, I remember years ago, um, someone at Universal just said, Well, we don't work with people we don't like. We don't have to work with people we don't like. And the same will go for reliability. It doesn't matter how good you are, if you promise stuff and then don't show up with it, yeah. you just won't get used again. So, I mean, it's it's not very rock and roll, but we've always tried to keep a, a pretty business-like schedule. You know, we start at maybe nine or half nine and work through till five or six, partly because then we can be contacted and we can mm -hmm. contact people. We don't, it's not a kind of a night hall business for us. Yeah. We keep a pretty regular business day and we meet our schedules. I don't think we've ever missed a, a, a deadline because it's like any other business. If you promise something, you've got to deliver it. And you've got to be professional, you know, if people, you've got to be able to take criticism. Yeah. That's something, you know, it's not easy. That, I was gonna, that's a really good point actually. And this is where working as a writing partnership, it, criticism is much easier to deal with when there are two of you. To Except kind of... from each other. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's particularly painful. <laughs> No, but so working on your own as a composer, if you're criticised, you've got a, you know, you've got no one else who's worked on that piece of music with you. That you can blame. You're kind of, <laughs> it's it's difficult. You're taking knocks yeah. on the chin that are quite difficult. So, yeah. um, I mean, that's just our experience, and I know other uh, other pairs of writers who who would agree with that, and other individual writers who who would also agree with it from the downside yeah. so that, i mean but you do have to take criticism yeah um and yeah. A, a, a useful thing to do is when you've received a piece of criticism don't respond to it straight away because nearly always your response will be one of kind of anger or frustration <laughs> um so just don't write that email. Well, you can write the email, but yeah. don't send it. Look at it the next morning. And, and we think. find it very cathartic to actually write a furious email. Yeah. It's normally about budgets rather than critique, actually. But, well, yeah. It but, so we write these furious emails, and then we go, right, park that for the night. <laughs> then come back in the morning when we've calmed down and go, 
glad we didn't spend it. <laughs> okay, then don't read my last email. <laughs> um, one last question that I can think of is uh, what about like music that has been released previously like a lot of independent artists do create music put it on YouTube or like streaming services and like it's it's over there can they use that same music that wasn't released by a label yeah yeah so long as it's not tied up with a publisher yes they can use it they probably have to take it down off whatever they put it on so they'd have to take it off youtube or whatever streaming service um but yes they could reuse it i mean just on that subject we've encountered a couple of situations where composers new composers for us have expressed surprise that once a piece of music has been signed over to us they can't still create an independent income stream from it they've sort of said well uh, well surely i can still keep this and, ha and release it as a track well you can't it's it's signed over to a publisher the publisher might release it as a track with you but you know you can't register a track with one publisher and then another publisher certainly not without their agreement yeah but but like you say there's no problem no. to release if it's a recycling thing again um, but it, it's just a case of whether it's already signed elsewhere. It's worth mentioning that um, uh, the contract that you would sign for a piece of production music is significantly different to uh, a commercial release. Um, commercial releases, more often than not, the publishing will be only for a certain length of time and various other kind of uh, negotiable uh, sides to it. Whereas, and it will have, sorry to interrupt, it, it will also have... Um, the mention of selling physical units and things like yeah. that which library music almost never has unless yeah. like it's yeah. very very occasionally a library track might get picked up on a compilation album for a tv program but i i'm not sure it's ever happened to us with several hundred library tracks um so and i think that sometimes takes composers by surprise a bit they go well it's not like the record contract i had there's no mention of this and it's and what do you mean it's for infinity well it's that's the way it works yeah that's just the way it the is. business works but it it's something to be aware of and check it out you know don't don't just sort of assume it's the same sort of thing um but you know we it's been our world and it's served us well so yeah you know. um and do you think it would be better for artists to go with deals that they offer down payment uh per album or just that they take a bigger share like or they getting rarer and rarer Sort of, okay. Yeah. It's I mean, a, sorry. Go on. Well, it's a it's a changing world with library deals, and I don't want to go into too many specifics here. But basically, because some libraries are offering um, deals that that don't carry mechanical royalty, mm -hmm. it's a more sort of a subscription basis, and so libraries that don't run that situation that that. Um, set up are having to do different deals with composers um, where mechanical royalties may not be included or they may be reduced it's it's for another webinar that and it's quite a complex yeah. technical situation um, and in some cases the lack of mechanical royalties is being compensated more by an upfront payment in some cases the the presence of a mechanical royalty will now mean that you don't get any upfront I, we couldn't comment on what's better. That would be a judgment for composers and it would be between them and their individual libraries. But it's, I think what I'm trying to get at, it's a bit more com of a competitive world now that there are different royalty models out there. Mm. Well, you, anyone who follows on Instagram, you'll be seeing royalty free music popping up all the time. There are a lot of now quite big companies doing royalty free music. So they are directly competing with uh, the traditional production music libraries. I think most of their uh, aim is at the social media side of things at the moment. So, mm -hmm. so that's where they're kind of focusing, but it, you know, it's having, it's, it's having a big impact on, on the traditional production music libraries. So the whole business, is becoming more competitive from the uh, publisher's point of view, which ultimately, unfortunately, means that it the 
composers are being squeezed more in terms of upfront money and the royalty splits and things. So it's something to be aware of. And unfortunately, it, you know, it is something where there is an increasing amount of pressure on, on companies to sort of remain profitable. And, you know, so it, I like everything nowadays, you know, you only have to look at companies like Amazon kind of crushing all the smaller guys. You have to yeah. remain competitive in, in some way. And, and uh, you know, it's for you to make the judgment as to whether there's an unreasonable amount of work being asked of you for the potential return. So. Um, well, well, we're, we're done with the time, uh, <laughs> but I, I wanted to ask you about Audio Jungle, but I'll leave that to our next webinar. What was the, uh, when you wanted to ask us? Uh, about Audio Jungle and like libraries like Audio Jungle. Uh, I like the, is that like the Audio Network or? Audio Jungle, it's like the, um, well, it's a, they started, I think, a few years ago. It's like where they offer music like really really cheap and they have like any artist can upload their music over there right yeah i mean it's we, it's not something we have a great deal of experience of but i think it's like it's included in that that area yeah. and you said that it's 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 competition and you know i'm absolutely not going to sit here and sag it off it's a different model you know this on all of these platforms there's good music and it's just the model you choose i'm not I'm not going to sit here and say that it's yeah, yeah. time. It's not what we do. Um, it's a competitor, but you know, competition is healthy. Without competition, there wouldn't be Flexi Tracks, because yeah. Flexi Tracks was born out of trying to provide a service that didn't exist. And um, you know, whether it whether it is a great success or not, we we hope and we're working hard. But there's no guarantees. But you know, you try and evolve to, to um, compete and survive. Great. Um, do you have anything like any, anything to say to the artists who are watching? Good luck. Yeah, <laughs> good luck. I think, yeah. I just think... keep at it or uh, take advantage of any um, opportunities that come your way because uh, there's a lot of luck involved in uh, when we look back at our careers, there have been kind of pivotal moments which seemed insignificant at the time, but we, made the right choice take advantage of anything that's kind of offered you in terms of opportunities get on with people be business-like and enjoy your music that's my yeah. <laughs> and i i think you know be patient yeah it's a long haul and and i think and again i don't want to sound uh, gloomy but i don't think there's anyone any point in my career where for any length of time I've thought well that's it I've arrived yeah. I've just you know I've got to the pinnacle of my career and I've made it you know we're we're knocking on a bit now and I still feel like I'm forging my career so it, it but that's the joy you know it wouldn't yeah. be, it wouldn't be fun for long if you thought well I've reached the peak of it it's always about just pushing forward and just you know it, as Andy said, the most important thing is to enjoy it, but to be patient, work hard, and and appreciate it's going to take some time. And I mean, there's never a point where I, where the phone just rings itself, and we're just overburdened with work all the time. You know, there's just a constant push and constantly working hard, and that's the fun of it. Yeah, yeah, and like just. You know, start working, put your music out there, reach out to people, uh, get whatever deal you get. If it's exclusive, not exclusive, you know, the first thing comes your way, do it. And like, just start, put your step in the door, you know, like take that first step and then yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. build I mean, from there. Can I just say one thing that is, is actually quite important on this. There's a fine line between, and it's a, far, it's a line that we've trod throughout our career there's a fine line between doing stuff cheaply to to actually get work mm -hmm. that maybe leads to more work there's a fine line between that and long term undermining your value oh yeah and this is really quite a big point so what happens was a lot of the tv stations for years behaved very honorably and had a set amount that they would pay for their music and and it's not a dig at the tv stations because every business in 
every walk of life. You know, as things get tougher and more competitive, they think, well, we'll see if we can get things done a bit cheaper. And because music is such a desirable career to get into, for every person that says, well, it's a thousand pounds to write a theme tune, there's someone who says, well, I'll do it for 500. And for every person that says that 500, there's someone who'll do it for 100. And for every person that says they'll do it for 100, there's a thousand people that will do it for free. Because it's getting a foot in the door or a foot on the ladder. But you have to be careful because if you do that too much, you undermine your ability to earn anything in the future. Now, mm. we've definitely done this where you think, well, I'll do a bit of a favour, I'll do it a bit cheaper to get in with this producer. Yeah. But what almost invariably has happened is that the producer comes back to you and says, well, I'd like you to do another piece of music. And we go, well, right, well, now it's going to cost the proper rate. And they go, well, I don't really want to pay the proper rate. So if you weren't doing it for what you did last time, we'll go somewhere else. So you actually end up oh, wow. sort of, it's like a, they call it a race to the bottom. Don't yeah, they? it's a very difficult call as well because there have been occasions where we have done things a little bit cheaper just to kind of get in with yeah. the producer. And yeah. then uh, later on it's led to well-paid jobs. So it's a very difficult call. Yeah. And you, I, I and don't you, can't, think you can't lecture people say yeah. you mustn't do stuff on the cheap because, yeah. you know, people, yeah, people do people need to start yeah. and get in. Yeah. But if everyone can just be quite careful that... It's very unlikely if you do something on the cheap that people are going to come back and not expect to pay the same price or go yeah. somewhere else. Where so they so you should cheap. always bear that in mind. Yeah. But good luck, everybody. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Like it was absolutely amazing talking to you guys. Like really, thank you. No, it's always oh, been pleasure. great yeah. uh, to find someone who listen to us. <laughs> 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 sure and um i'll like for the people who are listening to us if you have any questions you can hit us on facebook instagram you can email me like anything you need i can hook you up and yeah we're know. very happy to answer anything via email that's no, never a problem yeah, yeah. all right thank cool. you so much not a problem okay thanks so again, bye. Cheers. thank bye. you guys bye bye